In this video, we are going to discuss the mathematical description of a single qubit. In Newtonian physics, we use the concept of a point mass to describe forces and motions. In quantum physics, our go-to model for describing a particle in a closed system is a vector in a Hilbert space over the complex numbers. To fully understand this mathematical model, you will need some basic knowledge about linear algebra, specifically about complex numbers and Hilbert spaces. A quantum system can be a lot of things. An electron, a photon, a superconducting circuit, or an ion suspended in an electromagnetic field. To describe these systems, first we are going to need a list of distinct states they can be in. These states can be specific positions where the system can be, specific energies it can have, polarizations that we can distinguish, etc. Just as a reminder, a quantum bit is a quantum system with two distinct states. By distinct, we mean that we can design measurements that distinguish them with perfect accuracy. Any arbitrary state can be described as a superposition of these distinct states. If a system is in a superposition, then a measurement could probabilistically find it in either one of those states. Previously we stated that any qubit can be characterized by two real numbers corresponding to each distinct state. One is a probability and the other is a phase. Now we will examine how to derive those numbers. To create a rigorous mathematical description, we will associate each of these states with a vector in a Hilbert space. As long as the states represented by the vectors are distinct, the vectors are going to be orthogonal to each other. Remember, a Hilbert space is a linear vector space with an inner product, and therefore a norm, and this space is also complete with regards to the norm. But what does this mean? The inner product is an operation that maps a pair of vectors onto the complex numbers. It has several useful qualities. For example, the inner product of a vector with itself must be real, non-negative, and it can only be zero if the vector itself is the zero vector. These qualities make it possible for us to define the length of a vector using the inner product. So having an inner product is the first requirement. The other quality a vector space needs to qualify as a Hilbert space is to be complete. This means that there should be no points missing from the space. If you can converge to a point with a Cauchy sequence of vectors, then that limit must be in the Hilbert space. This quality will allow us to use the tools of vector analysis in a Hilbert space. In quantum mechanics, a unique notation, the so-called bracket notation, is used to denote vectors. This distinguishes between two types of vectors, the bra and the cat. The cat vectors are used to describe the state of the system. Something being a cat vector is indicated by an asymmetric bracket that looks like the second half of the inner product. In case of finite dimensional space, you can think of cat vectors as column vectors. Every qubit can be associated with a unit length vector in a two-dimensional Hilbert space. In that space, the two distinct states form an orthonormal basis. Note that the labels 0 and 1 refer to the bit value and not the vector itself. It's not the null or the unit vector we are talking about. The 0 and 1 are simply labels and the convention is that we label our basis vectors with binary numbers starting from 0. A general cat vector can be described as a linear combination of these basis vectors. Bra vectors, on the other hand, are row vectors, at least in a finite dimensional case. We denote them with another asymmetrical bracket that looks like the first part of an inner product. We can construct the bra equivalent of any column vector by taking its conjugate transpose. This will be very useful since the inner product can be defined as the usual matrix product between a bra and the cat vector forming a full bracket. This is the reason why we denote bra and cat vectors the way we do. This is also how they got their names. Bra and cat are slightly distorted versions of the first and second half of the word bracket. Note that this representation introduces a slight difference in convention. While mathematicians consider the inner product to be linear in the first and antilinear in the second argument, in the bracket notation 
it's the other way around. The inner product is linear in the second cat argument and antilinear in the first bra argument. So far, we identified our two distinct states that will serve as our 0 and 1 and described them mathematically. But what about an arbitrary state? Since the equations of quantum mechanics are linear, the superposition principle holds. This means that if any two vectors satisfy the equation, then any linear combination of these vectors will also satisfy the equation, at least formally. In reality, only those superpositions that are normalized describe actual physical states. This means that we can construct any arbitrary state by taking the normalized superposition of the basis vectors. Note that we need a constraint on the scalar coefficients in order to make the vector normalized. We are going to call the scalars in our linear combination probability amplitudes. If we write these complex numbers in exponential form, we can easily read the phase corresponding to each state. The probability can be calculated as the absolute value square of the probability amplitude, or conversely, the square of the modulus. Thus, we have identified the two real numbers corresponding to each state. For example, a classical zero state means the probability amplitude of a cat zero vector is 1, and the probability amplitude of the cat1 vector is 0. If we were to measure the value of this qubit, then the result would be 0 100% of the time. For a classical 1 state, it's the other way around. If we used probability amplitudes, whose absolute value square is 1 half, then the measurement would yield a 0 or 1 50-50% of the time. Note that the probability doesn't change if we multiply the scalars with a normalized complex number. Consequently, we can freely multiply the linear combination with any complex number whose absolute value is 1. Although this changes the phase globally, but the phase difference between probability amplitudes remains unaffected, and since we have no operations that depend on the absolute value of the phase, only the relative one, we can safely say that the global phase is just a mathematical artifact without physical meaning. The other thing we have to talk about is why the constraint on the probability amplitudes is what it is. The reason behind this is indeed because the absolute value square is the probability. These states form an event space in the sense that the outcomes of the measurement are mutually exclusive and the measurement has no other possible outcome. This concludes our mathematical introduction to qubits. In summary, a qubit has two distinct states, a 0 and a 1. These states are associated with a pair of orthonormalized basis vectors in a Hilbert space. An arbitrary state can be described as a superposition of these two states, the coefficient of which are complex numbers called probability amplitudes. You can identify the phase corresponding to each state as the phase of the complex number, and the probability of finding the system in that state as the absolute value square of the probability amplitude. Thanks for watching. See you at the next video.